Chapter Eleven: What I Heard in the Apple Barrel. No, not I," said Silver. "Flint was cutting. I was quite a master along of my timber leg. The same side I lost my leg, old Pew lost his daylights. It was a master surgeon him that amputated me, out of college and all, Latin by the bucket and what not. But he was hanged like a dog and sun dried like the rest at Corso Castle. That was Robert's men that was and comed of changing names to their ships, Royal Fortune and so on. Now what a ship was christened? So let her stay, I says. So it was with the Cassandra, as brought us all safe home from Malabar, after England took the Viceroy of the Indies. So it was with the old Warus, Flint's old ship, as I've seen her muck with the red blood and fit to sink with gold. Ah! cried another voice, that of the youngest hand on board, and evidently full of admiration. He was the flower of the flock, was Flint. Davis was a man too, by all accounts," said Silver. "I never sailed along o' him. First with England, then with Flint. That's my story. And now here on my own account, in a manner of speaking, I laid by nine hundred safe from England and two thousand after Flint. That ain't bad for a man before the mast. All safe in bank. Tain't earning now. It's saving, does it? You may lay to that. Where's all England's men now? I don't know. Where's Flint's? Why, most of 'em are bored here and glad to get the duff. Been begging before that, some of 'em. Old Pew as has lost his sight and might have thought shame spends twelve hundred pounds in a year like a lord in Parliament. Where is he now? Well, he's dead now and under hatches. But for two years before that, shiver my timbers, the man was starving. He begged and he stole and he cut throats and starved at that by the powers. Well, it ain't much use after all," said the young seaman. "Tain't much use for fools. You may lay to it that know nothing," cried Silver. "But now you look here." You're young, you are, but you're smart as paint. I see that when I set my eyes on you, and I'll talk to you like a man. You can imagine how I felt when I heard this abominable old rogue addressing another in the very same words of flattery he had used to myself. I think if I had been able, that I would have killed him through the barrel. Meantime, he ran on, little supposing he was overheard. Here it is about gentlemen of fortune. They lives rough and they risk swinging, but they eat and drink like fightin' cocks. And when a cruise is done, why it's hundreds of pounds instead of hundreds of farthings in their pockets. Now the most goes for rum and a good fling, and to see again in their shirts. But that's not the course I lay. I puts it all away, some here, some there, and none too much anywhere, as by reason of suspicion. I'm fifty, mark you. Once back from this cruise, I set up gentlemen in earnest. Time enough too, says you. Ah, but I've lived easy in the meantime. Never denied myself and nothing the heart desires, and slept soft and ate dainty all my days. But when at sea. And how did I begin? Before the mast, like you. Well," said the other. "But all the other money's gone now, ain't it? You daren't show face in Bristol after this. Why, where might you suppose it was?" asked Silver derisively. "At Bristol, in banks and places," answered his companion. "It were," said the cook. It were when we weighed anchor, but my old missus has it all by now, and the spy glasses sold, leases and goodwill and rigging, and the old girl's off to meet me. I will tell you where, mate, for I trust you. But it'd make jealousy 'mong the mates. And you can trust your missus? 
asked the other. "'Gentlemen of fortune,' returned the cook, "'usually trust little among themselves, and right they are, you may lay to it. "'But I have a way with me, I have. "'When a mate brings a slip on his cable, one as knows me, I mean, "'it won't be in the same world with old John. "'There were some that was feared of pew, and some that was feared of flint.' But Flint, his own self, was feared of me. Feared he was, and proud. They was the roughest crew afloat, was Flint's. The devil himself would have been feared to go to sea with them. Well, now I tell you, I'm not a boasting man, and you've seen yourself how easy I keep company. But when I was quite a master, "'Lambs wasn't the word for Flint's old buccaneers. "'Ah, you may be sure of yourself in old John's ship.' "'Well, I, I tell you now,' replied the lad, "'I didn't half a quarter like a job till I had this talk with you, John. "'But there's my hand on it now.' "'And a brave lad you were, and smart too.' "'answered Silver, shaking hands so heartily that all the barrels shook. "'And a finer figurehead for a gentleman of fortune I never clap me eyes on.' "'By this time I had begun to understand the meaning of their terms. "'By a gentleman of fortune they plainly meant neither more nor less than a common pirate, "'and the little scene that I had overheard was the last act in the corruption of one of the honest hands.' perhaps of the last one left aboard. But on this point I was soon to be relieved, for Silver, giving a little whistle, a third man strolled up and sat down by the party. "'Dick Square,' said Silver. "'Oh, I know Dick was square,' returned the voice of the coxswain, Israel Hands. "'He's no fool, is Dick.' He turned his quid and spat. "'But look here,' he went on, "'Here's what I want to know, Barbecue. "'How long are we a-going to stand off and on like a blessed bumboat? "'I've had almost enough of Captain Smollett. "'He's hazed me long enough, by thunder. "'I want to go into that cabin, I do. "'I want their pickles and wines and that.' "'Israel,' said Silver, "'your head ain't much a count, nor never was.' "'But you're able to hear, I reckon. "'Last ways your ears is big enough. "'Now here's what I say. "'You'll berth forward, and you'll live hard, "'and you'll speak soft, and you'll keep sober till I give the word. "'And you may lay to that, my son.' "'Well, I don't say no, do I?' growled the coxswain. "'What I said is, when, that's what I say. "'When?' "'By the powers!' cried Silver. "'Well, now, if you want to know, I'll tell you when. "'The last moment I can manage, and that's when. "'Here is a first-rate seaman, Captain Smollett, "'sails the blessed ship for us. "'Here is this squire and doctor with a map and such. "'I don't know where it is, do I? "'No more do you, says you.' "'Well, then, I mean this squire and doctor shall find the stuff "'and help us to get it aboard by the powers. "'Then we'll see. "'If I was sure of you all, sons of double Dutchman, "'I'd have Captain Smollett navigate us halfway back again before I struck.' "'Why, we're all seamen aboard here, I should think,' said the lad Dick. "'We're all forecastle hands, you mean,' snapped Silver. "'We can steer a course, but who's to set one? "'That's what all you gentlemen spit on first and last. "'If I had my way, I'd have Captain Smollett work us back into the trades at least. "'Then we'd have no blessed miscalculations and a spoonful of water a day. "'But I know the sort you are. "'I'll finish with them at the island as soon as the blunt's on board, and a pity it is.' "'But you're never happy till you're drunk. Split my sides. "'I've a sick heart to sail with the likes of you.' "'Easy, old log, John,' cried Israel. "'Who's a-crossing of you?' "'Why, how many tall ship 
Ships think ye ne'er have I seen laid aboard, and how many brisk lads draw in the sullen execution dock, cried Silver, and all for this same hurry and hurry and hurry. You hear me? I seen a thing or two at sea I have. If you would only lay your course and appoint a windward, you would ride in carriages, you would, but not you. I know you. You'll have your milk full of rum to-morrow and go hang. Everybody knowed how you was a kind of a chaplain, John, but there's others who could hand and steer as well as you, said Israel. They liked a bit of fun, they did. They wasn't so high and dry, no how, but took their fling like jolly companions, every one. So, said Silver, well, and where are they now? Pew was that sort, and he died a beggar man. Flint was, and he died of rum at Savannah. Ah, they was a sweet crew, they was, only where are they? But, asked Dick, when we do lay them athwart, what are we going to do with them, anyhow? There is the man for me, cried the cook admiringly. That's what I call business. Well, what would you think? Put em ashore like maroons? That would have been England's way. Or cut em down like that much pork? That would have been flints or Billy Bones. Billy was the man for that, said Israel. Dead men don't bite, says he. Well, he's dead now hisself. He knows the long and short on it now. And if ever a rough hand come to port, it was Billy. Right you are, said Silver, rough and ready. But mark you here, I'm a easy man. I'm quite the gentleman, says you. But this time it's serious. Duty is duty, mates. I give my vote. Death. When I'm in Parliament and riding in my coach, I don't want none of these sea lawyers in the cabin a coming home unlooked for like the devil at prayers. Wait is what I say, and when the time comes, why, let her rip. John, cried the coxswain, you're a man. You'll say so, Israel, when you see, said Silver. Only one thing I claim, I claim Trelawney. I'll wring his calf's head off his body with these hands. Dick, he added, breaking off, you must jump up like a sweet lad and get me an apple to wet my pipe like. You may fancy the terror I was in. I should have leapt out and run for it if I had found the strength, but my limbs and heart alike misgave me. I heard Dick begin to rise, and then someone seemingly stopped him, and the voice of Hans exclaimed, Oh, stow that! Don't you get sucking of that bilge, John! Let's have a go of the rum! Dick, said Silver, I trust you. I've a gauge on the keg, mind. There's the key. You fill a pannikin and bring it up. Terrified as I was, I could not help thinking to myself that this must have been how Mr. Arrow got the strong waters that destroyed him. Dick was gone but a little while, and during his absence Israel spoke straight on in the cook's ear. It was but a word or two that I could catch, and yet I gathered some important news, for besides other scraps that tended to the same purpose, this whole clause was audible. Not another man of them will jine. Hence there were still faithful men on board. When Dick returned, one or another of the trio took the pannikin and drank, one, to luck, another, with a, ears to old flint. And Silver himself sang in a kind of song, ears to herself and old your luff, plenty of prizes and plenty of duff. Just then a sort of brightness fell upon me in the barrel, and looking up I found the moon had risen, and was slivering the mizzen-top, and shining white on the laugh of the foresail, and almost at the same time the voice on the lookout shouted, "'Land ho!' End of chapter 11